What's up, Westside? My name is Gianna, and I get the honor of welcoming you here today, whether you're watching in the morning, night, night, far or near, wherever it is. So glad that you are here and you're logged on watching with us. If you're new, first off, welcome. So glad that you decided to log on and watch. I have a special little gift for you. So if you head to the comment section down below, there's gonna be a link that says new. You're gonna click that, fill that out, give us all that good information. Just our way of getting to know you, being able to follow up with you and give you a free West Side Muck. So you're definitely gonna wanna do that. Again, so glad you're here. And if you're wanting to know a little bit more about just what goes on in the West Side world, definitely make sure to follow our Instagram page and our Facebook page. Head to the website and just explore a little, see what's coming up. We have some events coming up that we're gonna continue to talk to you guys about. Brooks is gonna announce some things, some exciting things that we got going on. So just remember to keep your eyes and ears out open for that. And make sure also to get on our email list too and check those inboxes. There are always ways for you guys to get involved if you wanna volunteer and you're just looking for a place to serve, whether that's in person or at home, whatever it is, reach out to us, go on the website and just let us know if you're interested in serving in some way. We would love to have you a part of our team. I always love being able to say thank you so much for faithfully giving. Thank you so much for your generous gifts. It does not go unnoticed. And I hope you guys know just how much of an impact you're making, not just at Westside, but just furthering the kingdom in general. I hope you get to see how uh, your gifts and your generosity is, is used to uh, further the kingdom. And we as a West Side just get to be vessels through you. And it is an amazing thing that I just hope you get to see the benefits from. So we love that. Thank you so much for your gifts. And if you want to continue to do that or maybe start doing it, there's going to be a graphic on the screen where you can see those different ways how to do it. So there's a text to give option, um, the app, Tidely app, or you can head to our online website and give through there. Uh, or if you're able to come in person, then we have that option as well. So thank you guys so much again. It really goes way more than you think it does. So thank you again. And that's all you got from me, but I'm gonna hand it on over to Brooks and the rest of the service, and he's gonna announce a few more exciting things and hope you enjoy. I'm wearing my summer camp t-shirt tonight. So if you've got kids, you probably walked down, the, walked down the hall and you just saw a lot of hustle and bustle because we started summer camp tonight. Uh, and so your kids are having a blast at camp and summer camp's gonna last all summer long. So every Sunday night, um, every Sunday night is just, is gonna be summer camp and you don't have to attend every one. It's not that sort of thing. In fact, in fact, if you know people that have kids and you're like, man, maybe their kids would love to be a part of this too, then it's the perfect, easiest way to make that invitation. Say, hey, come, we're taking our kids. Why don't you bring your kids? It's a great way to help introduce people to a church and introduce people to Jesus. And um, we're really, really, I'm really proud of all of our kids' teams, everybody working back there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Summer camp is on its way. And if you serve back there, you get to have one of these, all right? I'm not serving back there, but I still get one because I'm the pastor, all right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I love it. It's an awesome shirt. Um, hey, I want to let you know, also, the 4th of July is coming up, and the 4th of July just happens to land on a Sunday this year. And so we've done different things in the past when that happens, but this year what we're going to do is we're not going to gather here on the 4th of July. 4th of July is, hey, you go and be the church wherever God takes you, wherever, whoever you're with, family, friends, whatever. So we're not going to gather for church here on the 4th. We're going to go be the church scattered on that evening. And we're going to, you know, celebrate however you celebrate the 4th. Um, and, uh, and so I just want to let you know, put that in your calendar. We're not going to be meeting here on the 4th. Um, also, we're taking a trip to Mexico. We're going to go on a home building trip to Mexico in November. And so um, I, I been, we've been sending out some information about that. But after service, just right after service tonight, um, I'm going to be right up here. I'm going to talk to you for like four minutes. So for the people that are interested, the people that just want to get more info, just meet me in the front after service. I'll answer any questions, give you the, the up to the, to the minute information that I have about that trip coming up in November. Last, but not kind of last, um, but not least, um, after service today, just right out in the lobby, we just celebrating summer camp. It's starting. We got a bunch of ice cream out there for everybody tonight. So just stick around after service. There's going to be ice cream for you. We were banking on warmer weather when we made that decision, but we got the rain. And you know what? Our, our parched land could use the rain, and so we're grateful for it. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, that's why we're having ice cream tonight. 
Okay, this is kind of an announcement, but it's kind of like, it's just it's something that's been brewing in our church for a long time, and that's actually a pun. You'll figure that out in a second. Um, but uh, something that's been brewing in our church for a long time, but we have dreamed for a long time as a church of, of like opening up a coffee shop on the west side of town because there's not really any really great coffee shops on the west side of town. And uh, I live over there and it's just there's not a place. And so we dreamed about that. We've schemed about that. You know, we've, we've just, we prayed about that. And even though there hasn't been like a brick and mortar sort of coffee shop place for us, we, we took a different route. We said, you know what, actually, and actually I think this is actually a much more strategic and missional way of going about it, is we started dreaming and scheming, what would it look like for us to have a coffee cart, like an espresso trailer? Um, and, uh, and, you know, what would that look like? And how could we leverage that? How could we use that? And so um, I'm going to give you a little bit more of the vision here in a second. But uh, the guy that we've hired to just like to build out this, this horse trailer, he converts horse trailers and turns them into espresso trailers. Um, we bought it. We purchased it. And it's right here. There's a picture of it. Um, that is our new trailer that we got. Um, it's not, he hasn't worked on it yet. It's not finished, all right? Um, it, somebody, somebody, I think Jeannie said it looks a little bit like the Mandalorian, which I think, yes, it does. I love it. I love it. And so what's going to happen is that is going to get transformed and converted into this, something like this, all right? It's going to look like that, or maybe it's going to look like this next one, or maybe it's going to look like this next one, or maybe it's going to look like this next one. Not really sure. It's going to look like something like that, but that's what's being built for us. And so our church said, hey, this is, so here's the vision. Here's the heart. It's not just so we could have like espresso drinks out before and after church. That thing will be parked in the front. You'll be able to get drinks and stuff. That's not the main reason why we're doing it. Although it's the Northwest. We care about our coffee. And, uh, and you know, and that'll be a really fun thing. It's not about that. The thing that I'm most excited about is the point of having this is not, just, it's not for us. It's for our community. Because when we have this, it's on wheels. That way we can say, hey, remember when all the fires happened last year? It was just horrific. And what if we had this? What if we drove it all the way upriver and we said, hey, all you first responders, thank you for everything you're doing. Drinks on us. We care about you. What if, what if we could take it to a public school and say, hey, teachers, administrators, it's been a tough year. Thanks for everything you're doing. We're going to be parked out for outside your school at four. Free drinks on us. Thanks for what you're doing. We care about you. Like, think about it. I mean, it's on wheels. We can take it wherever. We can go wherever with it, and we can serve and bless our community with it. And so I'm excited about it because it's happening. It's been a long dream of mine, and it's in the works, and I'm just hoping that our church can just rally around it and make it be awesome. So um, in the history of my eight years here at Westside, we have never taken, well, sorry, uh, take that back. We have taken two special offerings. Only two in eight years. Okay, so we just don't do that kind of thing. Maybe you grew up in a church where, like, every time it was the, the pastor's wife's birthday, there was an offering, you know, like, or, you know, there's like some churches, they do offerings for everything. We're not that kind of church. Uh, but because, of, because this is such a significant vision, um, our church has already put, ahead, put forward the finances to get it built, to get it here. But what we need in it is a really good espresso machine and a really good grinder, because those things matter to the life of our coffee. Can I get an amen? That those, those things are important to the coffee, all right? And so, and so next slide here, this is the goal is I'm, I just want to, I want to raise $8,000. I know you're thinking like $8,000, can't you just buy like one for 250 bucks? And like, yeah, that seems like a good espresso machine. I promise you, like a good espresso machine, one that's going to last us, it's about, it's about $6,000 is what we're anticipating on spending on that. And then a grinder, you know, perhaps another two, but I think eight will safely just get us all that. So I just thought, you know what, Westside, probably if we scraped, we could just pay for everything just with tithes and offerings and just with some of our budgeting that we've done. But I thought, you know what, I would just love to invite you to participate in this with us. Um, so that way when you see it driving around the, the, the city, when you see it parked somewhere, you could say like, man... I helped. I helped with that. Like, I helped come make, help that come to fruition. So um, that's what I'm looking to raise, and I'm hoping to raise it within the next four weeks or so because it's going to be here probably right around the 4th of July. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, you know what? In just on top of your reg regular giving, if you're going to write a check, you can just write in the memo line, hey, this is for the coffee trailer. If you want to give online, then there's going to be like a drop-down menu where you can designate that, hey, I want this money to go there. So there'll be some, an online option and an in-person option for you to be able to participate in that. But anyways, I just, this is the first time I've gotten to share this with our whole church, and I am excited. Isn't it a cool idea? It's cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so thank you, thank you for just partnering with us as we just think of creative ways to serve our city. For me, that's, 
It's one of my favorite things about following Jesus together. Now, could I have Olivia come up? Olivia, if you could come on up. And Olivia is going to read the scripture that we're going to look at today. And we're continuing on with our sermon series that we've done. This is our fifth week talking about doubt. How do we follow Jesus in the midst of our doubts? Olivia, could you read it for us? Thank you, Olivia. I love that passage of scripture. Paul's letter to the Colossians. And um, he says that God created all things and that God's in all things and that he holds all things together. And so we're in the sermon series on doubt. We covered lots of things, but here's the basic premise is that healthy churches talk about doubt, but unhealthy churches don't talk about doubt. Healthy churches talk about doubt. Unhealthy churches don't. Healthy families talk about doubt. Unhealthy families don't. And I apologize if you grew up in a church that was unhealthy and didn't talk about doubt. I apologize if you grew up in a home that, that where you had doubts, but maybe it wasn't talked about, it wasn't shared. Uh, because here's my premise of this whole sermon series is that, health, that, that doubt is a legitimate space to encounter God. It just is. Doubt is actually a piece of faith. It's, it's a part of faith. And I can't go into it all because we've kind of built up to this point. At any point, you can get online, watch everything we've covered. We've talked about how people deal with doubt because of pain and suffering that they've experienced. We've talked about how people deal with doubt because of just misunderstandings and misreadings of the Bible. That's a big one. We've, t- we've covered all sorts of things. Um, but, uh, but basically, you know, conservative Christianity, if we could call it that, tends to demonize doubt. Meaning if you have some doubt, it's like, don't, you're, you've got unbelief. You can't have unbelief. You can't have any doubts. And so doubts can be, you know, questions can be minimized and even demonized. But then progressive Christianity, if we could call it that, tends to valorize and champion doubt in the name of authenticity, in the name of, of you being you, in the name of you, you just, you know, being your best self. So the progressive sort of side of, of Christianity can say, oh, you know, just, just be on your search for truth, have an open mind, but God forbid if you ever close your mind down on something solid, now you're a bigot. Now you're hateful because you've actually discovered some truth. And so, you know, there's these opposite ends of the thing. So we just wanted to take this sermon series and talk about how can we encounter God in the midst of our doubts. Um, and, uh, and so that's what we've been trying to do. And we've been spending some weeks talking about it. So if you're in a season of doubt right now, you are in the right place. If you're not in a season of doubt, you feel like you're good. Well, I promise you, something might come along really soon that might kind of shoot you into a season of doubt. You never know. And so I'm glad you're here. But here's what I want you to hear too, though, is don't just ask yourself, do I know this? Okay? Don't just ask yourself the question, do I know this? Because you might, all, you might know all this. Okay? I want you to go deeper. I don't want you to just ask, do I know this? I want you to ask, can I have thoughtful, graceful, and robust conversations with other people about this? Because we're going to talk about the interplay between science and Christianity tonight. Um, the relationship between science and Christianity. How do those two things work together? And you might know a lot about this, and you might have you know, heard plenty of sermons about this. Um, but what I want you to ask, what I'm hoping we can ask together is, is if you've got a friend, you've got a family member, you've got somebody that, that you work with, that, they're, that maybe this is their issue. They might not ever come here. They might never, not ever listen to this sermon, but they know you and they're a friend to you. And so can you have an informed, robust, interesting, just graceful conversation with people about their doubts when it comes to this interplay between science and faith? Um, um, I know that just like you probably, you know, I grew up in, in uh, I grew up going to school and I remember there was moments growing up in school where I remember when I heard about evolution for the first time and I was like, what is this? My parents didn't tell me about this. Like, were they keeping this from me? Like, wait, what? You know, like my parents taught me like that God created all things and then now I'm getting an alternate story. And the truth is, is there's all sorts of alternate stories about creation and life and how we can explain all of it. And, uh, and so our kids, you know, parents, if you're thinking about, you know, there's, we have a lot of young kids in our church that this is a really important topic for you to understand, wrap your brain around so that you can have great conversations with your kids about what they're hearing from friends, what they're hearing at school. Just this, this is worldview formation kind of stuff and it's really really exciting and this is part of what it means to follow Jesus is just to wrap our brains around this so here's the objection is many people if you're taking notes many people doubt God because they've been told that science has disproved Christianity that that's that's what you've been taught is that that 
uh, you people doubt God because they've been told that science has disproved Christianity. You know, science has disproved miracles. You know, the, as the story goes is religion was useful when we didn't know how weather worked. That, science, that, that, that religion was useful when we didn't know how, what the sun was and when we didn't understand human biology. And so religion was helpful when we didn't understand all this stuff in the world. But as the story goes, because now we understand the human body, or, or so we think, because now we say, hey, we understand the cosmos, you know, we understand. So now it seems like religion is just going to die away. Religion is no longer needed. Religion is just kind of some hocus pocus, you know, just kind of like believing in unicorns, you know, just believing in kind of fanciful, fairy tale-ish kind of stuff because science, we've got it now and it's going to answer everything for us. We don't need religion. That's what's been taught. And so what are we supposed to do with that? How does science and Christianity work together? And I just want to submit to you that there's actually no conflict. There's absolutely no conflict between science and faith between science and Christianity. If you've heard that or if you believe that, then you've been fed a false narrative that somehow science and faith can't coexist together when really science and faith in God's grand scheme of things are both, are both important and real and important and they go hand in hand. So there's all sorts of things that I could cover tonight and it might be interesting and helpful, but I, there's just a couple points I just want to get across so that you can just think more deeply about this. Maybe this is your issue, but maybe you've got a conversation brewing with somebody that you work with or a family member um, where you can where you can kind of kind of dig into this topic a little bit more here's point number one is point number one is the world is becoming less satisfied with scientific explanations to ultimate questions this is just the truth people believed for a long time that in the 19th century in the 20th century that religion would absolutely die out so many people believe that because they said we've got science now and so religion's going to go away but here's what we've seen here's what we've seen is the world is more religious than it ever has before ever has been before now you might say wait we i don't see that in america you know like what's going on well you just go to africa you go to china you go to south korea you go to most of the lower hemisphere and you will see Christianity absolutely exploding across the globe. You will see faith just coming alive. And it's interesting that we are more technologically advanced than we ever have before. Scientific discovery just continuing to barrel on. And yet, and yet, people are becoming increasingly less satisfied with the kind of answers that science can give us about ultimate questions, about the big questions, about the deep questions, because people have said, you know what, we understand that there's, that we understand the science, but it is not satisfying these deep, deep questions and longings that we have in our hearts. The next point is this, is many scientists are Christians. Did you know that? Many scientists are Christians. Now, I know many scientists aren't Christians, too. All right, there are lots of, there's lots of scientists that aren't Christians, but there's this false belief that the deeper you dive into science, the more danger you are becoming an atheist because it's absolutely not true at all. In fact, in fact, the funny thing is, is the opposite is true. The deeper people dive into science, the deeper they realize, whoa, this does not have all the, all the answers to the deepest questions. And so it leaves a lot of scientists who study, you know, astrophysics and molecular biology and, you know, and, and biochemistry. They go deep, deep, deep into the science and they realize, whoa, there is so much here. This had to have been orchestrated. This had to have been created and not just randomly, and not just rapidly, um, randomly happened. Um, our growing awareness of nature as a masterpiece just makes it increasingly hard for scientists that dive deep into those fields to remain atheists. It just is. One of my favorite thinkers, in fact, if you're interested in this topic, you want to Google a guy named John Lennox. He's a professor of mathematics at Oxford. He is beyond brilliant. And it's fun to listen to him because he's Irish. And so he's got that, you know, that, that, uh, that accent that I wish I had because my sermons would be way better if I had an Irish accent. Isn't it true? You guys would be leaning in like, whoa, that's deep if I had an Irish accent. Uh, but John Lennox is so brilliant. And uh, he, he, he debates, you know, just different people, different, uh, different atheists, you know, neo-atheists. Neo and here's a quote from him. He says, I'm not 
an atheist because I'm a Christian. He says, I'm not an atheist because I'm a scientist. Does that make sense? I'm not an atheist because I'm a Christian. He says, of course, that's a huge part of it. But mostly I'm not an atheist. Why? Because I'm a scientist. <laughs> because I've d- dove deep into the field and I've recognized that it is so big. There's got to be a creator. Um, the next quote, the more I study science, the more I believe in God. Albert Einstein. The more I study nature, the more I stand amazed at the work of the creator. Science brings men closer to God. Little science, however, takes you away from God, but more of it takes you to him. That's Louis Pasteur. Um, Indeed, it's so interesting to understand that so many of the foundational scientists that just, that pioneered modern science in all fields, all of them deeply devout. A deeply devout faith. Um, Copernicus, Kepler, Descartes, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Sir Francis Bacon, great name. That, that's a great name. <laughs> Galileo, Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, William Kelvin, all, all, and just, just, just to name a few. In fact, over, if you look over the last hundred years, all the Nobel Prize winners, 70% of them were Christians. Over the last hundred years, all the Nobel Prize winners, 70% of them says, I am, I am, I am I'm at the top of my field in my, in my field of study and everything points to a creator for me. To me, I just find that fascinating and interesting and helpful. And the reason why these pioneers of science actually dove into their science is because they believed that you could actually do science. <laughs> they believed that God was the creator and that that the world was governed by rules. And so because the world was governed by rules, there had to be a rule maker. There had to be someone behind it. And so for them, the pursuit of science wasn't, anti, wasn't atheist. It wasn't to disprove that God exists, but their pursuit of science was because they said, you know what, if we could understand this world better, we could understand better the God that made it. That was, that's what drove their curiosity. That's what drove the sciences to be pioneered and developed. Maybe you didn't know that because maybe you were in this narrative that you thought that, man, scientists, the deeper you get into science, the more atheists you become. Oh, no. Oh, no. I just dare you. I dare you. Dive deep and you will see God at the bottom. Number three is this. Science and religion have different functions. I love thinking about this. I could talk a lot about just this point. I had to pare this point down because there's so much here. Science and religion have different functions. So um, here's the thing about science is science does an excellent job of determining what things are made of and how things work, you know? Like, um, what is this made of? What is, the, what is the universe made of? How do things work? How do the universe works? You know, wh- what are you made of? Like, you, you know, you sitting there with your body, what are you made of? And how does your body work together? All those things are, are what scientists do. Doctors are really great at this. They understand your body and they understand what your body is made of. But if you're taking notes, although science is fantastic at determining what things are made of and how things work, it's ill-equipped to answer the deeper questions of what things are made of or what things are made for and why they work. I've got a slide up there. Can we get that slide? Because I need, I need to get it up there so people can, can see how I wanted to word that. There we go. Thank you. Although science is fantastic at determining what things are made of and how things work, it's ill-equipped to answer the deeper questions of what things are made for and why they work. You see the difference? It's so, so different. They have different functions. Um, in other words, you know, you could, you could use it in this cheeky example. You could ask the question, why is the water boiling? You could ask, why is that water boiling? And one way I could answer of why the water is boiling is I could say, well, because the molecules are being heated up and they're moving faster together and they're bouncing off each other. And so that's why the water is boiling. Or I could say, or you could ask me, why is the water boiling? And I could say, because I want a cup of tea. Same answer to the same question. You're answering it in a completely different way. One answer is because you're describing how water boils. The other answer is because you're, just, you're answering of what the water is boiling for. Another way of saying this that people have used in the past is that you can't get an ought from an is. Okay? You can, you can, science can determine like what, what, things, what, what something is. 
Science can determine, okay, this is what this is and this is what it's made of. But what science can't do is determine what a thing ought to be. You can't get an ought from an is. Does that make sense? Like, for instance, for instance, um, you can, science can tell us what a human is. Science can do an okay job of describing, like, what a human is. But science will not be able to tell you very well what a human being ought to be. Interesting. Science can tell you that cloning can be done. Science can figure out that cloning could be done, but science can't, within that scientific field, it can't tell you whether cloning ought to be done. Do you see? There's different approaches to describing this beautiful, beautiful world that you live in. And so religion and science, it has different, different functions. They work together. Now you might, say, you might say, well, they have different functions. Well, then why does the Bible then make scientific claims? Why does the Bible make scientific claims? You know, some, that's been one of the things that's tripped people up is you think, you know, we read the Bible and it seems like it's making scientific claims like miracles, like you go to Genesis and it's the earth was made in seven days. And this isn't a sermon about that in particular, by the way, because that's a whole other conversation. But we might ask those questions and outsiders would look in and read the Bible and say, oh, the Bible says the earth was created in seven days. Oh my gosh, like, can we really believe this? Like, what about the science? But I just think there's just like a, there's like a disconnect because the Bible, everybody, I think everybody can agree on this, that the Bible wasn't written as a scientific document. That's not what the Bible is for. The Bible wasn't written as a scientific document. Let me give you an example, because the Bible is filled, filled with metaphor. And you've heard me say over and over and over again that can we, when people ask me, can we read the Bible literally? Brooks, do you think we should read the Bible literally? My answer is yes, absolutely, absolutely. There are parts of it that are literally eyewitness accounts. There's parts of it that are literally metaphor. There's parts of it that are literally history. There's parts of it that are, li- that are literally, um, um, that are literally a metaphor and, you know, just, and, and there's parts of it that are literally poetry. There's all different ways that we're supposed to read the text. And so when we read the whole Bible as a scientific document, then sometimes we're just gonna get caught in the weeds because that's not the necessarily the Bible's whole approach is to give us a scientific document. So one example is from the book of Exodus. Um, there's this verse that says that God was leading the Israelites into the land. There's this land, this promised land, and God described it as a land flowing with milk and honey. Have you heard that before? That this land that I'm going to lead you into is flowing with milk and honey. Is that literal? Was God giving them a literal, like, scientific interpretation of what the, the promised land was going to look like for them? Were they expecting to walk into the promised land and it's like, honey wave, you know, like milk flow, milk rivers. It's just like flowing, like honey bubbling up from the ground. No, no, because, because it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. But that metaphor is pointing to something real. Oh, yeah. The metaphor is pointing to something real. Just like this. Jesus was with his disciples and he said this. He said, I am the door. I'm the door. Is Jesus speaking literally or is he speaking in metaphor? Well, Jesus was speaking in metaphor, but was he saying something true and real? Oh, yes, because metaphors point to truth. And in that way, in that way, when Jesus says, I am the door, he is, is he a door? Oh, yes, he is. He's in fact probably a more literal door than any of these doors here in the room. He's a door. And so let's not confuse what the Bible has to say about things and think it's all pointing to science because when we do that, we just get caught up in the weeds and that's what caused so much controversy and people are like, ah, I just can't believe any of the Bible at all. We have to dive into these conversations with people, help people understand. The next point is this, is get comfortable with mystery. Get comfortable with mystery. There's mystery in science and there's mystery in faith. John Lennox, I mentioned uh, him the other day. He was speaking at this conference, and, and after he tells this story about this really world-renowned physicist that comes up to him after the conference. And the physicist comes up to him, and he says, and he says John, so you're a Christian, and that means that you, and you teach mathematics at Harvard, and that, belie- that means that you believe that Jesus was both God and man at the same time. Come on. That is hogwash. That is ridiculous. Can you, do you really believe that Jesus was both God and man? How do you explain that? How do you explain that to me? 
I'm not going to believe it unless you can explain it to me. And so John Lennox looked at him and he said, well, I'll, I've got a question for you first. And so he asked, what is consciousness? Can you explain it to me? And the guy said, um, no, I can't. And he says, let me try a different one, more in your field. Um, can you explain energy to me? And the, the, the physicist said, well, I can, we can measure energy. We know, we know what energy looks like. But John says, no, 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 you know what I'm asking you. Can you explain to me what energy actually is? And he knew very well how to answer that question. Because you just look it up. You just Google, do people really know what, do scientists know what energy really is? No. And he says, I can't describe it. I, I, I can't tell it. I can't show it to you. And so John says, but you believe in consciousness and you believe in energy, right? And he said, I do. I believe in those things. And yet you can't describe them to me. You, there's mystery even there. And so we have to be comfortable, whether we're talking about science, faith, everything. We live in a mysterious world. If I took you to Riverbend and I scanned your brain, I could learn a lot about your brain, but I wouldn't get to know you, would I? Science could tell me some things about your brain, but science isn't going, I'm not going to be able to scan your brain and learn from you about what your favorite food is. I'm not going to be able to learn from you, like what some of your favorite childhood memories were. The only way I can actually get to know you isn't through science. It's through conversation. It's through relationship. That's the only way I can get to know you is if we embark in a relationship together. And friends, this brings me to my last point. Number five is this, is God speaks to us through what he's made. Oh, yeah. Through creation. Oh, yeah. He speaks to us through the scriptures. Oh, yeah. But especially he speaks to us through Jesus. If God's going to get to know us, if God is going to get to know, if he wants you to get to know him, then God did everything he could to help you get to know him. He sent himself into the story. I was up in Seattle uh, this last week with, with, uh, with my family, and, um, and my dad picked up me and the boys from the, from the airport and took us on just like a fun mancation day, you know, like we just did some fun stuff around Seattle, and we ended up at the Museum of Flight right next to Boeing, and it's really, really fun. You could just be there for all day long because there's so much stuff to look at. But we're walking around, and they had a really special display on just the beginning of space travel. And just, you know, they had all sorts of really cool artifacts there from some of the first moon, landing, moon landings and everything. And I, and I stopped and I read this plaque about this Russian astronaut named Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gagarin. In 1961, he was the very first human being to orbit the planet in space. The Russians beat us to that part of, uh, of the space race. They sent up Yuri Gagarin. And at the time, Khrushchev was the premier of Russia. And at the time, Russia was deeply entrenched in atheism. Just the whole, you know, just like from top, from the top down, it was, you know, like God doesn't exist. And there's this famous, famous quote from, from Khrushchev, the premier of Russia, after Yuri Gagarin came back from space. Here's the quote. He said this. He says, why do you cling to God? Gagarin flew into space, but he didn't see any God there didn't see God there. And that was back in 1961, and C.S. Lewis was alive at the time, and C.S. Lewis wrote this rebuttal of, of what Khrushchev said. It's, called, it's in this article called The Seeing Eye, and here's what, here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if there was a God, you wouldn't be able to relate to God like you would relate to someone that lived in the second floor. See, Khrushchev said, hey, uh, we sent somebody up to the second floor. There was no God there, so that proves there is no God. But C.S. Lewis says this, is you, that's not how it works. It's relating to God isn't like sending somebody up to the second floor and seeing if God's there. It's not how it works. He says, you know what it's more like? He says, if there was a God, you wouldn't relate to him like that. You'd relate to him like Hamlet relates, relates to Shakespeare. See, Shakespeare is the author of Hamlet. You would, in other words, C.S. Lewis, if he was alive today, he would say, if, if there really was a God, you'd relate to him like Iron Man relates to Stan Lee. He'd say that you would relate to him like Sam and Frodo relate to Tolkien. You don't send somebody up to the second floor to find God. That's not how it works. Because God's the author of all things. And so Hamlet is not going to be able to find out about Shakespeare by looking up in the rafters of the playhouse. Iron Man is not going to find out anything about Stan Lee by like flying up as high as he can to try to find him. 
Sam and Frodo are not going to find anything out about Tolkien just by rummaging around in the forest looking for him. That's not how it works. The way that the author, the way the the creator reveals themselves to their creation is by writing themselves into the story. You know how you'll watch a movie and sometimes there'll be a cameo by the director? You know those moments? It's in all the Marvel movies, right? Stan Lee is in all of them. Sometimes the director will write himself or herself into the story and it's kind of fun. But listen, that's exactly what God did for us. In the midst of this incredible world that he created, when all things are pointing to him, the ultimate way that God showed us who he was is by writing himself into the story, by sending Jesus. And he didn't write him into the story as a big ruler with an iron fist. He didn't write him into the story as a rich person with lots of power. He wrote himself into the story as a humble, humble man. He didn't have nothing to his name but he had everything to give to us. His life and his grace and his wholeness. I don't know if that's helpful for you in having some, having some help in understanding how do we tackle this, this kind of this big hairy thing, like how does science interact with faith? But there's a lot of really good answers. And so I just encourage you to just seek them out, read, think, listen to podcasts, study, because you're going to have some really great answers in those conversations. But ultimately, do you know where it all leads? It's not going to lead anywhere unless we're leading to the one that created all things. And that's Jesus. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to invite the band to come up. And as they come up, we're going to just sing this one last song. And, uh, and as we do, um, and as they come, I'm going to read Colossians again. I'm just going to read it again. Because the hope is this, is that in this incredible world that God created, we could have fun conversations about science and faith, but ultimately, here's what God wants you to know. God wants you to know that he has come into the story. He loves you. He cares about you. The invitation is for us to surrender our lives to him, to trust him with everything we have, to give ourselves to him completely. And when we do that, he transforms us from the inside out. I'm going to read from Colossians again, what Olivia read at the very beginning. Here's what it says. Christ is the invisible, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For, though, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Father, um, we know that we live in a really incredible world that you created. And it just bids us to just dive in and understand. So, Lord, we pray that, that, the, the, that science, the, all the fields of science would, would flourish. We pray that they would grow. We pray that we would just be so, in, so amazed by the order, so amazed by how we can take a big telescope and look deep into the universe, and then we can take a microscope and we can go to the smallest particles and we just see it continuing and continuing to amaze us. And Lord, we pray that as the sciences flourish, we, we would see you. We would see your hand in it. The God of the universe that is in control in your creation. Lord, we thank you that we get to live in it and be a part of it. And so, Father, tonight, just as we close and as we sing, Lord, I just pray that all of our hearts here in the room, that we would be humbled, that we would be excited about following you and serving you. Lord, and I pray maybe there would be some, someone in the room 
someone here tonight that is just ready to say, you know what, maybe this has been my issue. I just never saw how those, how those things kind of line up together. But I, I, I'm starting to see now that God and science are not exclusive from each other, that God created all things. And in him, I find myself. I can't find myself anywhere else. I can't find myself on a yoga mat. I can't find myself in just like a big search for, through, you know, what, what my heart is feeling. Lord, I can't find myself anywhere else besides you because you are our creator. Lord, just pray that we would just respond tonight. We would just sing and we would give our hearts to you in a fresh way. Thank you so much again for being here and logging on today and watching with us. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and we hope to see you next Sunday.